Well, good morning, everyone. That was a very muted kind of countdown there, wasn't it? I've seen a few people that look a little bit sleepy this morning. Um, does anyone need to just check their neighbour and wake them up a little bit? Just turn around to the person next to you, give them a poke or a wave or a smile. There you go. There's a little bit of hubbub. All right, all right, not too much. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. It's great to see you here this morning. Uh, my name is Nathan. I'm on staff here as community pastor at St. John's, and it's my privilege to welcome you and to lead us through this morning. Uh, we're going to sing the praises of our Lord. We're going to hear from his word. We're going to lift up his name as we celebrate the King of Kings today. And uh, we're going to start off with some sung worship. So uh, please, can I invite you, if you're willing and able, to uh, stand with me as we open up our service in a, a prayer, and then we're going to sing. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the King of Kings. We thank you that your name is worthy to be lifted high. And as we enter into sung worship, Lord, as we lift your voice, uh, our voices to proclaim your name high. We ask that you, by your spirit, would inhabit our praises. That as we start by singing your praises, Lord God, that we would then be open to what you would have to say to us today. From the youngest to the oldest, may our hearts be open to hear what you would have to say to us. Lord, we invite you here. We know you're already here. You're always here, even when we're not. But Lord, we want to open ourselves to you. And we do that to start with this morning by lifting our voices in praise. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to need a bit of help for our first song. It is called Sing and Shout. And I'm going to be listening out for the shout in particular.
one of the highlights of my week, getting led in worship by our young people. We're going to continue in praise today. On this Palm Sunday, we're going to sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Yes, Lord Jesus, we just declare your lordship, your kingship, 
We thank you, Lord, that you are God over all. And we do say, come have your way among us this morning. Amen. Amen. Friends, please do take a seat. Or continue chasing after the youngest members of of our uh, family. It is so good to see you. Don't worry, we'll catch her as she comes up and down. Just feel at home. (laughs) Cara, don't listen to me. Listen to your (laughs) mum. Okay. I've already, I've already given permission for someone to cause chaos this morning. I'm thinking I really shouldn't do that, should I? But uh, you're, you're really welcome here. If you've joined us since we've uh, started, uh, my name's Nathan. I'm on staff here as community pastor. And we're all welcome to gather here under the name of the Lord Jesus. Everyone has a place here. Everyone is welcome. And we just want to grow in our, in our love and our knowledge of him here in Harborn. Uh, and through that, maybe we can change the world. Or maybe if we can't change the world, maybe we can change Harborn for the better. And then once we've sorted Harborn out, maybe we can go a little bit further and we'll do Birmingham. Anyone up for changing Birmingham for the better? Good. All right, if you're not from Birmingham, get out. <laughs> It's great to, to be here this morning. We really do want to uh, uh, praise Jesus. A couple of things of church family news for those that might be new. Um, if you have only been coming maybe a few weeks or maybe you, you're new in the building this morning, you're really, really welcome. And uh, we'd love to connect in with you. Uh, there are plenty of these welcome cards that you can fill out with your details. And someone from team will give you a call uh, to have a chat, to welcome you, to find out a bit about you and to help point you in the right direction of how you can connect in with St. John's. Um, if uh, you'd rather speak to a real-life person, uh, we do have Alison Erie, who is going to make her way just slightly down uh, the middle way here. So Alison is our connector this morning, and uh, after the service, she'll be out in the corridor area, the foyer, the circulation area. Take your pick of what you call it, the hall bit, um, with tea and coffee. So if you are new, head towards Alison, and she'd love to have a chat just to make you feel especially welcome uh, and to give you information about St. John's. Um, in terms of what's coming up, you may have uh, got to this point and be like, ah, oh, there's some big festival happening in a week or so, isn't it? It's, it's not Christmas, what is it? It's Easter, we're into the Easter holidays, uh, and so we just want to draw your attention that there's lots going on this week in terms of Easter. I don't know whether there's a slide or not, but there are lots of cards uh, around that you can uh, take away to let you know what's going on. And just to highlight this morning uh, something that's not actually on the slide or the card, because it was a work in progress, is that there will be an open air service on Good Friday on the high street um, on, on Good Friday about half ten. And so that follows the walk of witness which starts at nine o'clock as you can see um, and the details are on the website the details are on the card here but we will aim, aim, be aiming to get to the high street at half ten uh, where it will be the churches together in Harborn, all taking a small part to come together uh, to proclaim the the Lord Jesus on Friday so if you are around on Friday although there's lots of things to take part in let's all try and gather uh, to as many of these things as we can so do be thinking about who you might be able to invite to some of these events as well. Uh, And two more things to mention. We have, thinking about Easter, next Sunday, but also on Monday, Thursday, is an opportunity to bring in uh, gifts for our resource day collection. So this is something very familiar to us now here at St. John's. Uh, Regular throughout the year, we have focus days of bringing in resources for those in need. And once again, we're collecting for the Quinton and Albury Food Bank and the Baby Bank. Uh, So this Thursday, Monday Thursday service, and also Easter Sunday, uh, you can bring in items for the food bank or the baby bank. Particularly, um, they're asking for nappies of all sorts of sizes and also baby wipes. And also, if you can, uh, toiletries, both for babies and for mums. So if you want to put a little bit extra on a shop this week or go out specifically to get those kind of items and bring them next Sunday, there'll be the normal boxes out in the area over there. Finally, just to draw your attention again to the RCB tent appeal, uh, we heard, uh, we saw a video a few weeks ago and we've mentioned it a few times, but our partner church, Resurrection Church Beirut over in Lebanon, um, are looking to build a, a big shelter alongside their building so that they can gather safely. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but on the video, uh, 
Krista, who is um, uh, one of our, our partners out there, um, mentioned that they'd, one of the pastors had recently narrowly uh, missed being shot at by a stray bullet. So it's for protection, but it's also for uh, gathering under, you know, in terms of uh, weather and, and safely. So if you can, please do follow the, the links on the website uh, and in the roundup to give in that way. Right, Diana. Do you want to come up? Are you going to lead um, us in prayer uh, for the children? Um, oh, while you do, can, you, can I see your palm? You can. Oh, that's good. That's a good palm. I've got a blue can, can I see on. your palms, by the way? <laughs> yeah, look, the palms are out. I see where we're going with this. Do you, do you, do you see where we're going with this? <laughs> Not well, those kind of palms. It's Palm Sunday. It it's is like... Palm Sunday. What kind of palms are we really talking about on Palm Sunday? Palm leaves. So uh, there might be some palm leaves waving this morning in our, some of our kids' groups to celebrate Palm Sunday. You might be aware of us at some point having a, a very uh, discreet Palm Sunday parade around the building. <laughs> um, just, you know, wave at us if you see us going across. Uh, yeah, so it's our last kids and youth groups for the Easter, uh, for this term before the Easter break this morning. Uh, so we'll be uh, having a two-week break. Uh, so this morning we'll be having uh, some Easter fun in our group. I should say Palm Sunday fun. Palm Sunday and Easter fun in our groups this morning. Uh, but it would be great if we could pray together mm. for our children and young people and their teams before we go out. Loving God, thank you so much that you gave your son Jesus for us as we celebrate today the coming of Jesus the King. We cry Hosanna and uh, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather here and to celebrate today. We do pray your blessing on uh, our children and our young people as they gather in their groups this morning. Uh, may that be a blessed time full of fun and friendship but also a time where we gather and we are able to draw closer to you. We thank you for the teams that are going to be leading them this morning, and uh, we just pray that there will be a sense of your presence in all that we do today. Amen. Amen. So if you know where you are going, children and young people, you can move off to your groups. If you're not sure, please do grab somebody and ask them, and they'll be very, very happy to point you in the right direction. Thank you. Friends, can I invite you to stand if you're willing and able? We're going to uh, sing some praises again to the Lord. As we do so, um, we'll uh, hand around the offering baskets. And those are the baskets are for those that are regularly here at St. John's, consider themselves members and like to give in that way. Um, as the baskets go round, um, if you are a visitor um, or you don't consider this to be your home uh, just yet, please do let the baskets pass by. There's no obligation whatsoever to, uh, to, to give. Um, but as they pass by you, if you've given in other ways, do take a moment to give thanks to the Lord for what he provides to us here. And uh, as we always pray um, over the, the giving at the front, we pray that we will be good stewards, that the Lord would multiply for his kingdom purposes. Because for in all that we do, it's for the Lord's glory. Whether we speak, we pray, we sing, we give, we do, it's all for the Lord's glory. It's all because he is the King of Kings. So friends, as we enter into sung worship, let's put aside the, the, the weeks we've had, whether they've been troubling or whether they've been really joyful. Whether you come and are able to sing praises from a, 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 a joyful heart, or whether you're able to just stand and acknowledge the truth of the words, even though that might hurt to actually sing them at this time. We are gathered here together from all walks of life to recognize the King of Kings. We say, Hosanna, the King of Kings, you are welcome here. 
and we sing your praises now. Amen. you have made to us individually and collectively are yes and amen in Jesus. Church, I just wonder if we could speak out some of those promises from the Bible over one another. 
there's something that builds our faith as we testify to one another about who Jesus is. So we'll keep the music quiet, but just begin to speak out those promises of God that have been important in your life. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lord so worthy and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lord Cause your name the greatest your name stands above them all we declare in this place that all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation
Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honour and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, your name is the highest name here. Amen. Friends, please do take a seat. In a moment, John, our associate vicar, will be coming to round off our sermon series on the Sermon of the Mount, speaking about judgment. Um, Before that, I'm going to read from the Gospel of Matthew. We are in chapter 7 and the first six verses. So if you have a Bible, please do follow it through. Words may well appear on the screen as well. Do not judge, or you too will be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John. Let's pray for you, my friend. Yes, please. Father God, I thank you for this man. I thank you. You've brought him back safely to us. We thank you that you have placed your word in his heart and we ask that you would anoint him afresh this morning, that he would speak truthfully through you, that your spirit would flow through him and that we would have the right posture of our heart to hear what you would say. Lord, fall afresh on John this morning, that we might hear from you and that he would be our teacher this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you, Nathan. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you, and as Nathan said, it's great to be back with you, having been away last week on a New Wine International ministry trip. Some of you will know that Marcus, a previous worship pastor and troublemaker in this parish, uh, and myself visited Italy to minister to church pastors and believers out there. It's a hard job, but somebody had to step up and do it. Uh, We did see, though, God do amazing things, really amazing, wonderful things. And I'll be sharing some of those stories over the next few weeks of all that we saw God do there. And we saw our own faith strengthen. This is always what happens, isn't it? When we step out of our comfort zone and we serve God and we see what God is doing somewhere else, I find that I'm challenged in that place by other people's commitment, their hunger, their faith of the pastors and the believers that we saw and encountered out there. And we also saw which is one of the best spiritual outcomes of the visit, our prayer life dramatically increased in intensity as we navigated the streets of Rome. And that wasn't the only thing that increased in intensity. It's amazing, isn't it, how driving, and more specifically, other people's driving, brings out the inner critic in us. A few years ago, whilst in curacy and driving around Uh, The wonderful town of Solihull, I remember stopping at a traffic light with just one car in front of me. The traffic light turned green and that car did not move as quickly as I thought it should. And then it stalled. And I remember raising both of my hands in frustration. Now the other driver saw me do that in his rearview mirror and opened his car door. He walked calmly to my car door, signaled to wind down the window, and something about his body language suggested that it was safe 
to do so. And so I did, and I was about to apologise for my impatience to avoid what I assumed was going to be the beating of my life. But before I could say a word, he said this, and I'm tempted to do this in the accent that he spoke in, but I won't. It was a wonderful, broad Birmingham accent. I'm going to do it. (laughs) We've all done it, mate. We've all stalled a car. And we both laughed and we, he got on with his journey. I went about my day feeling properly chastised and became, for the next few hours at least, the nicest and politest driver on the roads of Solihull. But I wonder if you've ever been in that position that I was. Have you ever been called out uh, for unfair criticism of somebody else? Or have you ever been on the receiving end of someone else's judgment? As we come to the end of this series on the Sermon on the Mount, we end today with these words of Jesus, well known to many, even if you have little or no faith, do not judge. I think our culture knows those words really well. We hear those quite a lot. Don't judge me. Don't be judgy. We hear that so often. But as Jesus goes on to say, even, uh, sorry, or you too will be judged. So, so far in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has looked at the character, the conduct, the secret life, the ambitions, and the worries of his followers. And now he turns in this last part of the sermon to how relationships, how our relationships are to be lived out in his kingdom. And judging how we judge others is where he chooses to begin to talk about those relationships, which kind of raises the question, doesn't it? What is judgment? At least how Jesus means it here. Surely what Jesus cannot mean here is that we're not to use our critical reasoning skills at all, especially in relation to other people. We need those, don't we? Are we to turn a complete blind eye to other people's faults? Do we stop making value judgments between truth and error, between goodness and evil? For the record, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at here. After all, so much of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is about us making a kind of value judgment as we think through the topics of anger, revenge, lust, and so on. And he's not talking also about the state and an end to the justice system that we have, or courts judging people, as Leo Tolstoy, the famous author, argued when he read this passage. Jesus isn't talking about the home or the workplace either where an appropriate discipline and critical feedback is needed and that creates, as the experts tell us, uh, when it's done right, uh, a healthy family unit or a positive workplace environment where people grow. The word that Jesus uses here for judge is a pretty broad word in the Greek. It means to pick out, to choose or even to divide But it's the context that grounds what Jesus is getting at, his famous words of planks and specks. And what he's getting at is this, judgmentalism. That's what he's trying to get at. And I love this definition from the pastor, uh, Bethany Allen. She says this, judgment is when we call out perceived evil or wrongdoing in another person without loving them. It's where we draw attention to someone else's wrong just to draw attention to it. Making a declaration about that person's identity, not just their actions. She goes on to say, judgment is always rooted in selfish and self-righteous motives and always produces shame in the other person. It deals in absolutes and it leaves no room for grace. What Jesus then is getting at in this passage, as he so often does throughout his teaching, is our heart attitude. An attitude that does not mean to assess people critically and fairly, but to judge them harshly. The perennial fault finder, if you like, who's negative and destructive towards other people and enjoys actively seeking out their failings. The person who puts the worst possible spin on other people's motives, who pours cold water always on their schemes and is ungenerous towards their mistakes. I wonder if you know someone 
like that. And I wonder, have you been somebody like that? That, Jesus wants to say, is not how you are to be if you're going to be my followers. This is not what it means to shine for me in this world. This is not what should typify the people of God. And Jesus goes on with his well-known image of eyes, specks, and logs to say three simple things to us if we're going to avoid falling into the trap of judgmentalism. Three things we need to see clearly if we're to avoid becoming people like that. Firstly, we need to see ourselves clearly. As verses 3 to 5 put it, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? That word brother there is Adelphi in the Greek. It can mean brother or sister. And pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother or sister, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. Jesus seems to be warning here that the very people who seem most eager to tell others what to do, or more likely what not to do, are the people who should first take a long, long look in the mirror before they begin. And this is a funny picture from Jesus, isn't it? I mean, it's supposed to be, I think, quite comical. Think about it. Imagine getting a four by four plank of wood and having it in your eye and then trying to see where you're going, what you're doing, never mind what other people are doing and getting up to. This is a ludicrous picture, isn't it? And it's supposed to be. That's Jesus's point. We've got a fatal tendency to minimize our own faults whilst exaggerating the faults in other people, often the same faults to be exasperated when they fail to move on at a green light and stall their car, despite, allegedly, the many, many times that we have done it. Even in verse 2, where Jesus warns that the standard we judge others by is the same standard that we will be judged by, speaks into this. If our judgment we bring to others is harsh, graceless, assuming of their worst motives then, Jesus says, that's the standard that we can expect to be applied to us. That is such a good encouragement, isn't it? To check ourselves before we open our mouths. This passage is attacking, I think, our warped value system, the way we see ourselves in the world. We need to clean up, Jesus is saying, our act before we look to other people's sins. Only then will we see clearly enough to help with the speck that's in their eye. Jesus says, you cannot help others. Not you shouldn't. He's saying you can't do it. It's impossible to do it before you've sorted that same problem out in your eye. To do so invites the rightful accusation of hypocrisy. It's deeply unloving. It does not see the person. It sees the fault. So judgment here is not something I think that we sit around and think about too much. I don't know what you do with your Saturday nights, but I don't sit about and wonder if I'm judgmental or anything. I probably should. It's rare, isn't it, for us to stop and assess if we are judging and how that's affecting our life. It's so easy, I think, to miss this. It's subtle. It's the mask that our culture uses and the license that we use often not to be in relationship with that person. It's how we avoid mixing with others that are different to us. It's a currency of our culture that we exchange without realising it, I think, every single day. From work colleagues to rogue family members to advertising billboards to our social media feed, which is one great cacophony of judgment, isn't it? Oh, look at that photo. Why are they wearing that? Oh, look at that quote that they've ripped off from that talk. You know, whatever it is that somebody posts on social media, it is, I think, just an infinite scroll, if I'm not being careful, maybe it's just me, of being an invitation just to judge every single person in turn. We have it in our celebrity culture as well, don't we? Judging who's in and who's out who's acceptable and who isn't. It's one of the greatest weapons, I think, that the enemy uses against us. It's subtle and it's silent. 
We bookend our judgment, don't we, as well, in ways that allow us to feel that we can get away with it. Bless them. Bless him, bless her, tagged on to the end of our judgment as if that will just then legitimise or take the edge off what we've just said, which is scathing. Or, I'm just kidding. You heard that one? Those nicisms that we put on the end of what we say so often gaslights the person who's being judged into feeling, well, am I being too sensitive about what you've just said, even though you've just ripped me to pieces? But judgment has the ability to tear down in a moment that which has been built over a lifetime. Those of us that have been on the end of it will know that only too well. And judgment like this sees us, uh, stops us seeing ourselves how God sees us. Jesus isn't dealing here, is he, as he does often throughout the whole of the Sermon on the Mount with the surface level of existence. He's dealing with what's in here. Once again, we see that Jesus loves, though, the judger and the judged. There's an invitation here for those who are caught out in such judgmentalism. When Jesus says, remove the plank, it's because to do so helps us to take the most important journey that we'll ever take in our lives, the inner journey, to look within Psychologists, I'm told, tell us that when we judge, we do it for a few main reasons. Firstly, we do it for insecurity, when we're unhappy with who we are. We think that making other people feel bad about themselves, or at least ripping them to pieces, will help us feel better about ourselves. But the research tells us that what Jesus has been saying for 2,000 years is right, that no amount of judging others will ever give you the security that you need within Secondly, we judge because we're afraid, we're scared. Perhaps the person we're judging threatens or intimidates us. Perhaps it's making fun of our boss at work behind their back. Maybe it's ripping somebody to pieces who we think is pretty or good-looking according to the standards of our culture. Thirdly, we do it because we're lonely. And if we know that very strong judgmental opinions can often bring others into our orbit, can't they? Eager to hear our pithy put-downs and strong criticisms of others. But those people won't stay long, and I'll tell you why, in case they're on the end of that judgment one day. And lastly, we judge because we're seeking change in our lives and we don't know how to find it. And when we see others walking on the road that we would love to be on, it can stir bitterness, even jealousy within us, fueling our judgment of others. Jesus' invitation here is to see yourself more clearly, to exchange our distorted view of the world and ourselves for a view of clarity. And it starts by sorting out our inner life. His kind invitation, if we can see it like that here, is to take the plank out of our eye, and it means we've got to look at that log for what it is. We have to look at the areas of pain in our life because so often that's the root of judgment of others in our lives. I think there's an invitation here to deal with the inner life. And we can face it because of who faces it with us. Psalm 139 says this, Search me and know me. See if there is any offensive way in me. The confidence of the psalmist is rooted in the fact that he knows the character of the one that he cries out to. And we can face our inner pain, the things that cause our logs in the first place, because of who it is that we're building our lives on. Make no mistake, if we live in it continually, judgmentalism will quench the Spirit of God in our lives. If we don't deal with this stuff within us, it spills out onto others. This is what it means to get specks and logs out of our eyes, dealing with the pain that is within us. Secondly, I think there's an opportunity to see others more clearly here. The German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we've quoted throughout this series really, because he's written extensively on the Sermon on the Mount and the kingdom of God and what it means to follow Jesus. And he's excellent on this. And he says this, When I judge, I am blind to my own evil, and to the grace granted the other person. Isn't that important that we realize that? I love that. 
For we read these verses closely, we see that Jesus does not deny that other people also have sawdust or specks in their eyes, and those need removing too. Look again at those words in verse 5. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. When we truly see ourselves clearly and take the steps to deal with our faults and sins, if we see our own faults as seriously as we do the faults of others, it would lead us, as Jesus gently points out here, to see others as our brothers and sisters, people in need of our help. It's important to note that Jesus is not asking us to only look after our own interests. Just because the heart attitude of judgmentalism is forbidden does not relieve us of the call to help others become better followers of Jesus too. As Jesus himself teaches in later on in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 18, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. I'm not sure if you've ever had something in your eye before that for the life of you, you simply cannot get out. It's quite vulnerable, isn't it, to ask somebody to come and help you. They have to get close. They have to get right in there because that speck cannot remain in that eye. The proper medical term for this is a foreign body. It doesn't belong there. It's usually painful. It's sometimes dangerous. And to leave it there and make no attempt to remove it would hardly be consistent, would it, with brotherly or sisterly love. We are both then to remove the log from our own eye and then, and only then, help remove a similar speck from our brother's and sister's eyes. Jesus isn't stopping criticism, and I think that's important for us to hear. He's stopping a criticism that fails to see each other as brothers and sisters that we should love. John Chrysostom, an early church father, had this to say on how we should treat a brother or sister in Christ. He said this, Correct them, but not as a foe, nor as an adversary exacting a penalty, but as a physician providing a medicine. Isn't that a beautiful heart posture? A physician providing a medicine. I love that. What a beautiful way to see others, ensuring that we have the right heart attitude towards them. And I think that's where we see the difference between unloving judgment and loving correction. You see, judging Lee sees the fault, but correction sees the person behind the fault and never loses sight of them. This is at the heart of what Jesus wants to say. He's showing us how we are to train ourselves to hold people responsible, but without making them feel devalued and without attacking their worth as a human being. Correction is needed. As a disciple of Jesus, it's something that we should be able to healthily receive and give. Scripture reminds us that people who can take correction are the people who are wise. As the writer of Hebrews reminds us, the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And the writer of Hebrews goes on to say this too. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Correction is not the same as judgment. Correction is where we see the best for the other person. And we do it in humility. We know our own sin and therefore we know when something's out of alignment. It helps others get back onto the path of discipleship. And let's be clear, if it doesn't do that, it's judgmentalism. Judgment sees the fault. Correction sees the person behind the fault. It believes in their good. That is the distinctive Dallas Willard, author, uh, pastor, great man, said this. When we condemn one another, sorry, when we condemn another, we really communicate that he or she is in some deep and possibly, just possibly, irredeemable way, bad. Bad as a whole, to be rejected. In other words, the condemned is among the discards of human life. He or she is not acceptable. We sentence that person to exclusion. Ultimately, if we follow the Jesus way, if we will see ourselves clearly with our need of uh, of our own sin and our need of grace, 
then it should transform the way that we see other people. John Watson was a 19th century Scottish minister and he famously said this, this, the per, this person beside us also has a hard fight with an unfavouring world, with strong temptations, with doubts and fears, with wounds of the past which have been skinned over but which smart when they're touched. It is a fact, however surprising. And when this occurs to us, we are moved to deal with kindly with them, to bid them be of good cheer, to let them understand that we are also fighting a battle. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, that's the kind of community that Jesus wants us to be. It's the kind of community his church is supposed to be famous for, this community of grace. But if we're being honest, that's not how the church and the followers of Jesus are sometimes known in this world, is it? are they? Jessica Oyelowo is a British actress who, along with her husband David, has moved to Hollywood and they found great success out there. They're both committed Christians and they speak very openly about their faith. On a recent podcast, she said this, People get angry with Hollywood for being anti-Christian, but let me just tell you this. Every single award show I've ever been to, you arrive in a car and they are in a queue as people get out onto the red carpet. As you are waiting in your car... Pavements are full of people with placards saying, you're going to hell. It is not motivated by love. It is impossible, she says, to go up to someone from the industry after that, at every single award show I've ever been to, when people are yelling hate in the name of Jesus. All they see is hate. I think that's really challenging for us as the people of God. Is that what people see of us? Is that what people think of us? I'm not sure we see others clearly if we don't see that they too are shown the same love and the same grace from Christ that I need. Do we see others as fighting a daily battle in this world? People to whom we need to help bring about Christ's restoration, his cleansing and his healing. Because that's what he's asked us to do. Lastly, I think Jesus invites us to see him more, him more clearly. In a way, this is what the whole series uh, about, is about. is about taking Jesus seriously. Taking him at his word. As the song goes, and our prayer might be as we come to a close. Oh dear Lord, three things I pray. To see thee more clearly. To love thee more dearly. To follow thee more more nearly. Our culture, I think, is so entrenched in a judgmentalism that divides and condemns that I think we scarcely notice it, and sometimes we walk in the same way. We believe and live in a world of council culture, of finger-pointing, of blame-shifting. We live in the age of the politics of protest, don't we? And there's a national election coming up at some point where it's not about having a political vision of the best of what this country could be, but an endless cycle of Well, I'm not that guy. That's how it feels at the moment, doesn't it, across the West? Well, at least I'm not that person, so vote for me. We live in a time where to disagree with someone can be interpreted as hatred. Jesus says, not so for you as my people. As we've seen, though, all too often his followers have failed to live up to the mark. All too often we condemn in others what are the weaknesses that we face dare not face in ourselves or we condemn people to hell when to do so is to step in the very place of God himself have you ever wondered why Jesus was so able to see other people so clearly how he was able to see their deepest fears and their needs how he was able to get to the heart of people's anxieties and cares with loving careful compassionate precision You know, Jesus is the only one, the only one in human history without a plank in his eye. He not only removes the planks in our eyes, but he takes those planks, doesn't he, onto himself. And the wood of the cross is a stark reminder of what is happening when Jesus surrenders himself to the cross, as we'll look at later this week. He who was the only one who could judge fairly chose to take upon himself the sins of the world so that justice could be done because he is a God of justice, 
but the price could be paid. That is what we need to see clearly about Jesus. And it's at the heart of the gospel that the person of Jesus, in the person of Jesus, God comes down from his justice seat and pays the cost for us. Isn't that good news? That's the gospel. That's what we're going to lean into this week. This is the story of Passion Week. And of course, on Palm Sunday, we read that story of the crowds singing, deliver us, save us. That's been commented so often of what a great deal of them would have meant is save us from them, from the Romans. Kick them out, Jesus. Turn us into a global superpower again. Because isn't that what you've come to do? They, just like us, needed to see Jesus more clearly, I think. Jesus comes down from the justice seat and pays the cost for us because he loves us. He takes the penalty for us. He takes the penalty for the world. He takes the penalty on his shoulders. And as he returns to his rightful seat, he sees clearly that the debt is paid. What he sees is those who turn to him are righteous. That we are clothed, as Paul puts it, with the righteousness of Christ. That is what he sees. All we need to do is receive that gift. All we need to do to get that and have him see us like that is say yes. All we need to do is see him more clearly. You know, this whole series is about allowing Jesus to see us and helping us to see who we really are, who others are made in the image of God, and that we might see who he really is, the King of heaven and earth. I can think of no better way that we could use the vacancy time at St. John's than this. What greater gift can we give the next incumbent than this? That we make Jesus our king and that we are desperate to see him more clearly. Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with these words. This has been the word, uh, really, the, the word that's been the control verse for the whole series. Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on the rock. A church, followers of Jesus, who do this, who take him at his word and live the way that the master wants us to, will be a sight worth seeing for Harborn. That will be something for people to see, be something for us to see as well, because It will be a church that points to a saviour worth seeing. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's just rest for a few moments in that that closing reminder that Jesus takes our planks upon himself and offers us love and forgiveness, mercy and grace instead of the judgment that we deserve. Let's take a few moments in silence now.
Friends, there is much that we can be praying for at the moment in our own lives, uh, that of our nation and across the world. We're going to spend a few moments uh, in prayer. I'm going to lead us. I'm going to work through Psalm 7 as a guide, just a few verses at a time, and then kind of leading us in, in a prayer. But there'll be time and space for you to fill in the gaps in in whatever way the Lord has placed people, places, situations in on, on your heart. After uh, each time, I might say the words, if I remember, um, Lord, in your mercy, and the response is, hear our prayer. Or you might want to say, hear my prayer. But we have a personal God. I come to you for protection. O oh Lord, my God, save me from my persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, they will maul me like a lion, tearing me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Lord, to start off with this morning, we think of our brothers and sisters who are persecuted for their faith in you. Some, Lord, in the early days were literally mauled by wild beasts. They were killed for your name. And Lord, we know that this is still happening around the world today in some places. That a public declaration of faith in you can lead to an instant execution. Lord, we cry out to you for them. That you would bring your spirit of peace. Lord, we can't even begin to imagine what it's like. Help us to join our spirits more closely with them, Lord, to care more deeply, to think more frequently of them. Lord, let us not take our freedom for granted. Lord, we thank you for the work of organisations like Open Doors. We thank you that they are seeking to not only spiritually but practically help our brothers and sisters. We ask for your hand of blessing upon their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord my God, if I have done wrong or am guilty of injustice, if I have betrayed a friend or plundered my enemy without cause, then let my enemies capture me. Let them trample me into the ground and drag my honour in the dust. Lord Jesus, we turn inward, recognising that we are not perfect. Recognising that we have things in our vision that obstruct the way we see others. Lord, we take some time now just to bring those things before you. Lord, reveal them to us. Not to condemn us, but to convict us that we might see others more clearly like you do. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. Arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Gather the nations before you. Rule over them from on high. The Lord judges the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent, O Most High. End the evil of those who are wicked and defend the righteous. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. And Father, we know that there is so much that is going on in the world that is not just. P 
people and nations are walking away from you. And people are hurting, Lord. Lord, will you stir in us a heart for justice? Will you stir in us a heart for right living? Will you stir in us, Lord, the knowledge and the wisdom to learn from our mistakes and to live as people that truly follow you? And we take a moment, Lord, just to name situations and countries that we're aware of and that are weighing heavily on our hearts. Friends, perhaps take this moment to speak out loud the countries or the situations that the Lord has impressed upon your heart. And we'll gather together in prayer for them. Lord, all the nations are yours. Help us to reconcile with each other, to join together, to put aside differences, recognising that we are all humans made in your image and that we should look on each other as brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God is my shield. Saving those whose hearts are true and right. Lord, we do need your saving power. Both for eternity, but also in this world. Lord, there is much sickness. There is much disease. Lord, there are many people that are on our hearts. We think particularly, Lord, this morning of the royal family. And for Catherine, Lord. But Lord, there are so many people as well that we know of, our neighbours, our own family. We need your saving power, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and shoot his flaming arrows. Lord, we recognize that we do need to turn to you. That though you love us unconditionally, We do need to turn away from the things that we do wrong and come to you. And we know there are many, Lord, that do not yet know that they need to do that. Or are making up their minds, Lord. And here today, we just thank you for the opportunities we have to reach those that do not yet know of your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we want to say we want to be vessels of your grace and mercy we want to be able to look upon others as you do we want to pour out your grace and mercy on them and so lord we think about our bridge building ministries particularly lord 
this morning, the ministries are focused on those outside of our fellowship. Lord, we ask that we would be people that would see clearly with eyes of love and grace. And that as we allow you to work in our own hearts, Lord, that we would have the honour and privilege of being trusted with people that need to come to you. Lord, we do not take this lightly. So help us, Lord, first to understand just how much grace you have poured out upon us. Let us repent that we might bring others to repentance of you, that we might share the joy that is available for everyone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The wicked conceive evil. They are pregnant with trouble and give birth to lies. They dig a deep pit to trap others and fall into it themselves. The trouble they make for others backfires on them. The violence they plan falls on their own heads. Lord, we recognise that though we seek to see every single person with eyes of love, we are not blind to the evil in this world, Lord, and we want to stand against it. As a church, Lord, show us where we can stand against injustice and evil. Show us where we can be good advocates for people. Help us not to tolerate even the smallest amount of evil in our own lives so that we can see clearly the impact of sin and corruption. Lord, we leave the vengeance to you. We leave the judgment to you. We ask that you would stir us to fight in the way you stir us to fight. Call us to a deeper passion for prayer and praise in you. Call us to more radical forms of love and service to others. Help us to love our enemies that they might see your love through us. Lord, we do not deserve your love. So let us show your love to those that don't deserve it because we are all united in that and we rely on your mercy and your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear my prayer. And I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Lord Jesus, your story does not end on Good Friday. In this week, Lord, we look forward to celebrating the victory that you have won. We do not fight as people defeated, desperately hoping that the battle will one day be won. We fight as people who know the victory and know that you call us to partner with you. We have a hope in you, Jesus. Help us to understand. Help us to really understand that hope and take that deep into our hearts that we might be people that do not worry but can rejoice in you, whatever the circumstance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, can I invite you to stand? We're going to bring our service to a, a close as we sing a final song.
It's in most melody.
to friends as we go from this place today. There'll be crosses available, palm crosses to take with you. As a reminder that we have a king, not the king that we were expecting, but a king who knows what he's doing, a king who dares us to live a different way, a way that brings reconciliation, peace, love, and joy to all because our king welcomes all into his kingdom if they will turn to him. So friends, let's go in that knowledge that there is a king of kings and a lord of lords, the God most high, and he calls us to fight in his name, but with the weapons of love. Amen.